my name is Noise, and I'm an anonymous remailer operator. That's been my standard handshake greeting for the past year or so, and I find that its reception as some kind of 12-step confession is not wholly uncoincidental. I think there are a couple of reasons for this. First, anonymous remailers are old hat these days. Most of the Kufa people have strayed off to work on sexier high bandwidth anonymity tools and protocols. I certainly don't begrudge them that. Distributed anonymous information storage and retrieval systems are neat, and the potential of a wide, widespread micropayment based remailer network coming online in the next couple of years pleases me greatly. However, a side effect of this interest shift is the resulting general misconception that the, that the current public anonymous remailer network is now unimportant and uninteresting, something I hope to dispel in the next 40 minutes. Second, there are a plethora of free web-based mail systems out there that, support, that purport to offer varying degrees of security to their users. Disposable accounts from Hotmail to Hushmail are easy for the masses to use. They have snazzy web interfaces which make account creation and mail management essentially painless. These features obviously account for the wide popularity and the varying degrees of security they offer is thought to be good enough for most people for most purposes. Thus, another misconception I frequently encounter is the notion that anonymous remailers have been rendered wholly obsolete by these web-based systems. But, even assuming each of these web-based systems offers strong end-to-end -end encryption, that by no means obviates the need for a public anonymous remailer network. Finally, there's a shocking amount of apathy on the part of many otherwise technically savvy and crucial people when it comes to what anonymous remailers really are and how they work. One of the main reasons I'm up here today is the result of a conversation I had with some people at DEF CON last year. Multiple times I've been asked what the big deal with running a remailer is. People actually ask me things like, don't they just strip out headers? These were not simpletons. One of them is giving an uber hacksaw talk here tomorrow. They've just never been exposed to remailers in any meaningful sort of way, and I found that disturbing. That said, today I'm going to cover how remailers work, who uses them, and who wants them shut down. Along the way, I'll also be shamelessly proselytizing in the hopes of convincing some of you to become remailer operators yourselves, and the rest of you, that the history, evolution, and recent developments surrounding the anonymous remailer network are still interesting, relevant, and cool today. To have a small disclaimer, running an anonymous remailer is just a somewhat glorified hobby of mine. I'll do my best to answer questions, but I'm by no means an expert. If I fuck up and say something boneheaded, please point it out to me, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, by far the best and most widely used, most known and most widely used remailer was anon.penet.fi, or Penet, run by Youth Helping Us, Hussing Us, out of Finland from 1992 through 1996. In its heyday, it was home to almost half a million users. Penet was not an anonymous remailer, it was actually a pseudonymous remailer, and it worked as follows. Suppose Alice wanted to post a message to Usenet without revealing her originating email address, say, alice at somewhere.com. Alice could mail her message to Pennet along with instructions specifying to which group she wanted the note posted. Pennet would then post her message to Usenet, replacing Alice's true email address with something like anon123 at anon.pennet.fi. Pennet maintained a list of true email addresses and the corresponding aliases on Pennet. This allowed people to reply to Alice without knowing her true address. Thus, mail sent to anon123 would be forwarded by the remailer to alice at somewhere.com. The Pennet system was free, simple, and really easy to use. Its location outside of the United States jurisdiction also made it quite attractive. Its admin spent approximately $1,000 a month running the system for what he described as humanitarian reasons and to, to, to permit freedom of expression about sensitive issues. Pennet helped everyone from human rights activists fearing reprisals to people recovering from sexual abuse to people with straight jobs who wanted to discuss their erotic peccadillos in public forums. Whole Usenet groups virtually owe their existence to Pennet. Unfortunately, Pennet had a rather glaring single point of failure. Yuf could readily determine the identity of his users by simply examining the logs on his system. This flaw ultimately caused him to close his remailer as the result of the following two legal attacks. On February 2nd, 1995, an American representative of the Church of Scientology contacted Yolf, informing him that some information residing on an internal Scientology computer in California was stolen and had been made public via Pennet Usenet post. The church claimed that the, that the information was classified as a corporate secret. The church reported this event as a burglary to the LAPD and FBI, and the representative of the church asked Yolf to reveal the identity of the user. After Yolf made it clear that he would not reveal the personal information of his users, he was told an official request had been sent to Finnish police via Interpol. 
On February 8th, Wolf was served with a search and seizure warrant on his home and the Pennant server, demanding the name of the anonymous user. Wolf managed to prevent confiscation of the entire server by giving the police information only on a diskette which he had copied. Wolf revealed to Finnish police that the anonymous ID would belong to an account at Caltech. Armed with this information, the Scientologist lawyers sent private investigators to Caltech that same day, demanding personal information on said user's account. To Caltech's credit, the school refused to give the Church of Scientology, or its private investigators, any information, but it ultimately did divulge the info to the LAPD detectives, who subsequently contacted the school. The second attack on Pennant came in the spring of 1996, after the Church of Scientology sued Grady Ward and subjected him to nearly 11 hours of deposition by Scientology lawyers. The church accused Grady of violating the church's copyrights by posting several of its advanced technology documents on the web via anonymous remailers. In the course of its lawsuit, the Church of Scientology again pressured Finnish police for access to Pennant's records, this time to determine whether or not Grady Ward had ever used remailers. Finnish police, bowing to the Scientologist's request, contacted Yurf in June of 1996, demanding that he turn over the names of two more users. Specifically, they sought the identities of users who had posted Scientology documents to Usenet in February and March. Yurf asked the Finnish court for a delay, and the court granted one until August 22nd. At the August 22nd hearing, the Helsinki District Court decided against Yurf and ordered him to turn over the names. In effect, the court ruled that email was not protected by standard Finnish privacy laws as other communications, such as telephone calls. Yurf appealed the ruling, but fearing that if he lost the case, he ultimately might be forced to compromise the identities of more users, he closed Pennant down on August 30th. He found the rise of other emailers throughout the world in the three years Pennant operated something of a consolation. Yurf was ultimately ordered to reveal the accounts by the Court of Appeals, which he did so to Finnish police. Amusingly, both accounts at Pennant were mapped to accounts at alpha.c2.org, a pseudonym server offering the potential for being very secure and able to resist the very kind of attack that shut down Pennant. Enter the cypherpunk, or type 1 remailer. Cypherpunk remailers have two vast improvements over Pennant-style remailers. They support chaining and PGP encryption. The structure of cypherpunk remailer messages is a nested set of encrypted messages where each message is encrypted through a remailer. The message contains instructions for each remailer, such as where to send the message next and the message to be forwarded. Each remailer removes a layer of encryption and accompanying instructions, takes any requested actions, and sends the message on to the next destination. This is easy to visualize through a tangible snail mail analogy. Suppose Alice writes Bob's address on an envelope. Inside the envelope is another envelope with instructions for Bob to mail the inner envelope to Charlie. Charlie gets the envelope, opens it, and finds a smaller envelope with instructions to send it to Dave, and so on, until the innermost message is eventually sent to its intended recipient. Of course, in the real world, nothing would prevent Bob from peeking inside of all of the envelopes, so the analogy isn't perfect, but you get the general idea. So, a standard cypherpunk emailer can send messages to another email address or post it to a news group, and it can accept encrypted messages with instructions for processing hidden, in, for instru with instructions for processing hidden inside the encrypted message. Anonymous remailers are designed to prevent traffic analysis. And while cypherpunk remailers substantially reduce the likelihood of a casual adversary gaining access to messages through a more trivial methods such as packet sniffers, it's important to note the weaknesses in the system, particularly against a very powerful adversary with access to many resources. Assuming an attacker is able to record the contents of all messages into and out of remailers, along with the times they arrive and depart. All messages are monitored as they leave the sender's machine and as they arrive at the destination. Also, the attacker is able to send an unlimited number of messages through the remailers, including previously intercepted messages. Messages can be prevented from arriving at their destinations by denial of service. Also, suppose the attacker has compromised some, but not all, of the remailers and knows the source, destination, and contents of all messages passing through the compromised remailers. This threat model may sound a bit steep, but I'm hardly comfortable saying that it is beyond the capabilities of certain TLA agencies who are present at this con today. The most fundamental problem with cypherpunk remailers is that messages can be traced through them despite their encryption and chaining capabilities. This is because incoming messages are forwarded directly after processing. Thus, when one message arrives, another message leaves immediately thereafter. With no further information, the attacker knows that these are the same message despite any precautions that may have been taken. This can be done retroactively using mail logs if they're kept. 
The first proposed solution to this problem was to delay incoming messages for some random length of time. If this time were longer than the time between message arrivals, then it would be impossible to know, with certainty, which incoming messages corresponded to which outgoing messages. Sounds nice, but this proposal is weak for several reasons. First, the exact amount of protection provided by latency is unknown. It depends on the traffic through the email at that time. If there are many messages arriving in the average holding time, then the identity of the message is reasonably well disguised. But if there's very little traffic due to normal fluctuations, network outages, or denial of service attacks, then little or no protection is provided. To provide some minimum level of protection, considering only normal traffic variations, the latency must be larger than it would have to be at times of maximum traffic. A proposal called reordering fixes this problem, but it opens up another possible attack. Reordering requires that a remailer keep a certain number of messages in the pool on the remailer at all times. The most efficient reordering scheme is to keep n messages in the pool and to send out one of the n plus one messages in the pool, including the one that just arrived, chosen at random. Unfortunately, this scheme is susceptible to a spam attack. An attacker sends many more than n messages to the remailer. These messages will displace all the real, real messages in the pool, leaving only messages which the attacker can recognize. If the attacker sends another batch of messages after your message arrives, your message will be flushed back out of the pool. Since the attacker can recognize his own messages, yours will be obvious. Combining latency and reordering gives some resistance to this attack. Rather than sending out one message from the pool each time a new message arrives, periodically all but n messages in the pool are sent. If, during an average period, several messages have arrived, then even if the pool of messages is flushed out, there will be more than just your message mixed in with the attacker's messages. If the attacker combines the spam with its denial of service attack, then your message would be the only non-attacker message again. There's nothing you can do if the attacker can ensure that yours is the only message traversing the entire network of remailers. With ideal remailers, your message could, could be any one of the messages passing through any remailer at the same time. If yours is the only message passing through the remailer network, then you're toast. Now, assume your message is chained through, email, through remailers that are delaying and reordering at every hop. Your message can still be tracked by its size. By default, messages decrease in size by a small and approximately known amount each hop. Even if your message is well mixed with the other messages in the remailer, and even if they are all different sizes, they are still distinguishable. It is possible to have the remailer remove padding from the message at each hop, but this only, decre this only decreases the size of the message. <sighs> Sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> This only decreases the size of the message and only to a minimum established by the size of the actual message you want to send. You're also limited by the, si by the fact that extremely large messages will stand out since your message must, be, must change size by a large fraction of its own size each hop to ensure maximum confusion. But removing padding at each step confuses traffic analysis, it still leaks information. All messages that leave a remail are larger than your message when it arrived are known not to be yours. And if the use of this feature is unusual, then your message will stand out as being the only one to change size by a non-standard amount. The solution is clear. To defeat this attack, all messages must be exactly the same size. Unfortunately, even reordered indistinguishable messages can still be tracked under the given threat model. Replay attacks can be used to follow a message to its final destination or to backtrack from the end to the original sender. Both types use a type of both attacks use a type of spam attack. To trace a message forward through the chain of remailers, the attacker captures your message and sends many copies of it to the first remailer. Many identical messages will emerge from the remailer and move on to the next one. This bump in remailer traffic will show the route to the message. When it becomes too dispersed from reordering, the message can be captured between two remailers and many copies reintroduced at that point. To prevent this attack, remailers must refuse to send any message more than once. This can be done by including a random ID for each hop, which the remailer records. To limit the storage demands on the remailer, IDs may be removed from the list after a period of time. The list could also be cleared whenever the remailer changed its key. Thus, even though cypherpunk remailers offer vastly more security than pennant-style systems, they have their limits. There are still security holes that can be used to discover the real sender of a message, despite the use of PGP encryption, chaining, latency, and reordering. Type 2, or mixed master remailers, render most of the attacks against type 1 remailers useless. The design philosophy of mixed master remailers was strongly influenced by David Chalm's 1981 MixNet paper. In essence, a mix, or in this case a remailer, is a service that forwards messages using public key crypto to hide the correlation between its inputs and outputs. 
So, if a message is sent through a sequence of mixes, one trusted mix is sufficient to provide anonymity and unobservability of communications against a powerful adversary. Mixmaster Remailers implement the MixNet protocol for electronic mail. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide of the structure of a, mix, of a Mixmaster message, and it's more complicated than nested PGP encrypted messages. Um, Mixmaster uses three triple DES keys for all data encryption, and 1024-bit RSA for public encryption of the triple DES keys. Mixmaster messages are sent as one or more packets, up to 255 packets total. Messages consisting of multiple packets are called multi-part messages. A Mixmaster packet contains a header containing information for the remailers and a body containing what's referred to as payload data. To ensure the packets are indistinguishable, all Mixmaster packets are exactly the same length. Each of the 20 headers is 512 bytes and the body is 10K. To send a message, the user the user agent first splits it up into parts of a fixed size, which form the bodies of Mixmaster packets, which can be compressed. The sender then chooses a sequence of up to 20 remailers for each packet. The final remailer must be identical for multi-part packets. The packet header contains 20 slots. For a sequence of n remailers, slots n plus 1 through 20 are filled with random data. For each of the slots 1 through n, a sender generates a symmetric encryption key which is used to encrypt the body and all subsequent header sections. So, a particular slot between 1 and n, call it i, will contain a key together with other control information. This bundle is then encrypted with the ith remailer's public key. To increase reliability, redundant copies of the message can be sent through different paths. However, the final email on each chain must be identical so that duplicates can be detected and the message is delivered only once. When a remailer receives a Mixmaster message, it will decrypt the first header slot with its private RSA key. By keeping track of the packet ID, the remailer then verifies that the packet has not been produced processed before. The integrity of the message is verified by checking the packet length and verifying message digest included in the packet. Then, the first header is removed, the others are shifted up by one, and the last section is filled with random padding. All header sections and the packet body are decrypted with the symmetric key found in the header. This reveals, a public key this reveals a public key encrypted header section for the next remailer at the top and removes the old top header section. ASCII armoring is then applied to the resulting message. The remailer collects several encrypted messages before sending out the resulting messages in random order. The header for the last remailer in the chain contains a flag indicating that it is the last hop and whether or not it is, the part, it is part of a multi-part message. If the packet is not multi-part, then the packet body is decrypted and the plain text is placed in a reordering pool from which it is ultimately delivered to the recipient. If it is one part of the message, the message ID is used... If it is one part message, the message ID is used to... Ad Nervous, sorry. If it is one part of the message, the message ID is used to identify the other parts as they arrive. When all the parts have arrived, the message is reassembled, decompressed if necessary, and placed in the pool. If all of the parts do not arrive within some time limit, the message is discarded. Only the last remailer on the chain can see that a group of remailer packets are all part of a single message. To all the others, they are completely independent. Mixmaster re remailers can offer a good deal of security to their users. As with Type 1 remailers, though, their security is not infallible. Obviously, the security of the MixNet relies on the assumption that the underlying cryptographic primitives are secure. There is no anonymity at all if remailers in a given chain collude with the adversary or if they are compromised during the lifetime of their keys. Using a longer chain increases the assurance that the user's privacy will be preserved, but at the same time causes lower reliability and higher latency. Sending redundant copies of a message increases reliability but may also facilitate attacks. An optimum must be found according to the individual security needs and trust in the remailers. Also, passive adversaries can observe some or all of the messages sent to mixes. The user's anonymity comes from the fact that a large number of messages are collected and sent in random order. For that reason, remailers should collect as many messages as possible while keeping the latency acceptable. Keep in mind, in essence, anyone with access to email, address, to email could use Pennant. If one had access to PGP as well and a few spare minutes to read the instructions, anyone can make use of the Cypherpunk remailer without any additional software. Mixmaster is different. Unlike the other emailers, you can't just make your own message and send it. To, and send it. Mixmaster security comes in part from using a special message format. You need a Mixmaster client to create Mixmaster messages. I'm sure you're all aware that the steeper the learning curve, the fewer users you get. That said, who uses remailers anyway? I'll indulge my megalomania for a moment and say, I do. 
and I have since the early 90s. Back then, it was usually the post to assorted news groups, which were, coincidentally, uh, young teenage girls are underrepresented. I posted anonymously for a number of reasons. First, you're a lot more likely to be taken seriously in a technical group, group if you're not a 12-year-old girl. Similarly, you're a lot less likely to get dismissed as a trolling mark or harassed in these groups with more interesting nature. Emails are also a nice way to alert individuals of computer-related security risks. Today, I normally use emails to post to any number of mailing lists to which I am subscribed. My concern now is not so much the immediate protection of my identity, so much as threading the archives. Email is as fast and casual as a voice phone call, but can be stored and retrieved with infinitely greater efficiency than paper letters or taped conversations. If the storage of that message is not protected, and it rarely is, it can be accessed by anyone who takes the trouble to rummage through any of the many archived computer records that may have received such a message. Think Deja News. I'm in law school. I'll have a real job someday. And 10 years from now, I'd rather not have my future opponents digging through archives to, to dig up my most recent political rants. Makes sense to me. <laughs> so why might you use a emailer? Maybe you're a computer engineer who wants to express opinions about computer products. Maybe they're opinions that your employer wouldn't like you to share. Maybe you work for Microsoft. <laughs> Maybe you live in a community that's violently intolerant of your social, political, or religious views. A poster to alt.privacy.anon server wrote, I consider myself to be a fairly good example of why anonymous emailers are needed on the net. To be blunt, I am bisexual, a pervert, and a witch. I also live in Alabama, where at least two of the three are illegal. <laughs> in a worst case... <laughs> in a worst case scenario, I could lose my job, have a career wound, face prosecution, and possibly even have to deal with violence. Maybe you're seeking employment via the internet and you don't want to jeopardize your, jeopardize your present job. Maybe you're looking for some action in LA personals. I don't really care. <laughs> Maybe you're a whistleblower afraid of retaliation. Hey, you might even be an honest bureaucrat seeking out these whistleblowers. Maybe you don't want people spamming your corporate address. Maybe you've reverse engineered something you'd like to share with others and you'd rather not be the subject of frivolous corporate lawsuits for your trouble. Bugs, exploits, and all sorts of interesting things are frequently reported this way. The source code for CSS authentication was released by the anonymous email network. Yay. <laughs> Maybe you feel that if you criticize your government, Big Brother will start monitoring you. Maybe you live in Kosovo. In early 1999, the anonymous email network allowed ethnic Albanians to provide first-hand accounts of Serbian atrocities in Kosovo without fear of retribution. We noticed a big spike of usage during that time. As Wolf said, emailers have made it possible for people to discuss very sensitive matters, such as domestic violence, school bullying, or human rights, anonymously and confidentially on the internet. The closing of a non pennant file will make it harder to discuss these matters. In short, there are many legitimate reasons why you, a law-abiding citizen, might use emailers. The issues here are the rights to, are rights to the freedom of speech and the rights to personal privacy. Having the right to free speech may work well in the case of verbal expression, but it may cease to have its intended purpose in face of retaliation that may take place decades later. In a system that theoretically can have infinitely large memory and infinitely long remembrance, the freedom of expression can become abused and perverted by a government that does not respect individual rights. This brings me to my third topic of the afternoon. At any given time, there are usually 20 public type 1 or type 2 emailers in the world. Of these 20, usually only half offer sufficient reliability to be of actual use. This has been the trend for the past year, for, for years. So you might be asking, if emailers are so great, why are there so few of them? The most benign reason, I think, is that running an emailer takes more time, energy, and, pac and patience than most people would care to spend on a free service. I run my email off an old P90 box, which I have attached to my university's network. Financially, it doesn't cost me anything to run it. It's one of my hobbies, so I don't mind spying, spending five weeks or so, five hours a week or so, to care and feed it. Other Remox actually pay to keep their emailers up and running. Everything from extra phone lines to co-location facilities frequently come out of their own pockets. If you've got some spare cash in your pocket, you might want to donate and help one of them out. Personal gratification and running an email can go a long way, but eventually the headaches and expense one can incur can outweigh the fun. I think the average lifespan of a email these days is somewhere between three and six months for that reason. Another reason for this is the fact that it's a largely thankless job. Most satisfied email users have little reason to praise their email operators. What would they say? Hey, I'm Jim and I used your service to come out of the closet. Thanks. 
Yeah, right. Instead, you're likely to accumulate a mass of complaints and threats. Many of them are amusing. 99% of them are harmless. I enjoyed some of the more illiterate ones so much I've taped them up on my fridge. I've been called everything from a communist to a neo-Nazi to a liberal for the simple act of running a rumor. I tend to laugh out loud picturing myself in any of these roles. I've also noticed that people like to give out legal advice when they're angry. One of my favorite complaints accused me of being, of being an accessory to accomplice harassment, which I was informed was not looked upon favorably in Washington State. Right, I see. Sometimes complaints don't go directly to you. Sometimes people complain to your ISP or your DNS provider. I've become well acquainted with several university officials as a result of running my remailer. I'm sick. I actually look forward to dealing with them. It means I get to wax poetic on fun things like the Constitution, the First Amendment, and the school's acceptable use policy. Other email operators don't have it so easy. Their SPs may terminate their service at will at the first sign of trouble. System administrators are often adamantly against the use of their sites for anonymity servers. They are afraid that they will be held responsible for acts such as terrorism or kidnapping, which could theoretically take place as a result of anonymous messages which pass through their system. Administrators would often rather shut down a remailer than deal with all of the politics that surround that remailer. This is one of the main reasons for the short lifespans of many remailers. One of the simplest solutions to all of this is to run a middleman remailer. In this mode, a remailer will not send messages directly to final recipients. Instead, it will only send messages to other remailers. Because it can never be used as the final hop in a message, the outside world never receives any remailed messages from the middleman. Voila, no complaints. The obvious drawback to middlemen is that they reduce the number of possible chain permutations. As long as there are plenty of full-featured remailers around, this doesn't matter much. But if only a handful of remailers were mailed to a final recipients, the situation could escalate rapidly from a robust remailer network to a network with single points of failure. But having more middlemen remailers around is better than not having them at all. They provide a useful service. They win their link in the chain. If you're interested in running a remailer, but you're genuinely concerned about your ISP's objection, middlemen are great, and I hope you'll consider it. Now, wild speculation on my part suggests to me that a far less benign reason that there are so few remailers in the world is that lots of people and organizations worldwide would like to see the demise of the anonymous remailer network and are actively working toward that goal. Governments that violate human rights, as well as organizations banning public and open discussion of their activities, such as the Church of Scientology, are among these. The Church of Scientology frequently threatens anonymous anonymity providers with lawsuits unless they curtail or terminate their services. They've been doing this for years, and they're still doing it. I received a nasty gram from one of the lawyers just last month. Obviously, though, governments may also have a keen interest in anonymous remailer usage. Remailers are in operation all over the world, and governmental attitudes toward them cover the whole spectrum. For example, a Viennese remailer operator recently pointed me to a webpage maintained by his local police department. The Austrian police actually recommend that citizens use remailers to post to Usenet as a method of privacy protection. In stark contrast, the operator of T2, a remailer in the UK, announced that he would be closing down his remailer this coming Monday because passage of the regu Regulation of Investigatory Powers, or WIP Bill, appears imminent. Fueled by fear fears of rampant anarchy, pornography, and digital black markets, the UK has pressed ahead with measures of intrusion into, internet, into the internet far more suited to China. The WIP Bill will connect UK ISPs directly to MI5 hard, hard headquarters by way of black boxes authorized to snoop, often without warrant, on email or, British, or other British domestic internet activities. You might think the obvious counter to this is it to call the Brits and tell them to use more encryption. Snoopers be damned. You'd be wrong. The bill also contains a requirement that computer users and companies hand over their decryption keys to the government on demand of anyone as low as a constable. Moreover, the WIP bill permits gag orders surrounding these key requests with possible jail time for anyone revealing key requests and fulfillments. WIP bills in their ilk should encourage those of us outside Orwell's England to use encryption and to run more remailers. I asked the UK remailer for his thoughts on closing down T2, and this is what he had to say. I see myself at the moment as in a situation, in, as in a similar position to Yolf in 1996. Faced with a choice between continuing with an untrustworthy service or making an honest shutdown, it is fairly easy to see what, what is preferable. If I continued with the current config, people would rightly have suspicions that the key had leaked to any of the endless list of government bodies of any kind who are supposed to be able to demand decryption and also keys in an ill-defined circumstance. Contrary to what government spokesmen have said, neither a court order nor a criminal investigation into anything nor suspicion of a crime by a person receiving the demand is required before the demand is made. It has been pointed out often 
that the mechanics of public keys mean that innocent people receiving messages from a suspect will be more likely to have notices served on them than the suspect himself. Thankfully, our own government has not yet succeeded in passing a similar bill. Additionally, we have a Bill of Rights which the UK does not have, and a healthy body of history and case law supporting the right to anonymity. Anonymous discourse has been an integral part of American literary, of American literary and social development. The responsibility of journalists not to reveal their sources is recognized almost universally. Many authors write under pen names, and there are still many cases where the true identity of such authors has yet to be discovered. Additionally, anonymous peer reviews of proposals and articles are common in academic circles. The intertwining of anonymous rhetoric and American social development is perhaps best evidenced by the Federalist Papers, arguably the greatest single work of political theory in history. The work may never have seen the light of day had authors James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, collectively known pseudonymously as Publius, been forced to reveal, reveal their true identities. Moreover, the Supreme Court has repeatedly confirmed the right to anonymity. Nevertheless, this has not stopped the U.S. government from trying to deprive us of our rights. At the carnival hearings a couple days ago, FBI lab director Donald Kerr pulled out the usual FUD with, me with much speculation and little or no supporting evidence. He said, as you know, the use of computers and the internet has grown rapidly and has been paralleled by the ex exploitation of computers, networks, and databases to commit crimes and to harm the safety, security, and privacy of others. Criminals use computers to send child pornography to each other using anonymous encrypted communications. Hackers break into financial service company systems and steal customers' home addresses and credit card numbers. Criminals use the internet's inexpensive and easy communications to commit large-scale fraud on victims all over the world. And, of course, you know, terrorist bombers plan, to plan their strikes using the internet. Investigating, and I'm not making this up. <laughs> Investigating and deterring such wrongdoing require, requires tools and techniques designed to work with new and evolving computer and network technologies. He continued to blather about striking balances between privacy interests, ISP interests, and of course the duty of government investigators to protect public safety. My favorite line though from his testimony was, quote, I would like to discuss how the FBI is meeting this challenge in the area of electronic mail interception, quote. A friend of mine pointed out yesterday that you know you've tweaked the FBI when they drag out child pornographers, terrorist bombers, hackers, and the usual suspects. I think the whole carnivore situation really underscores why we need more emailers and why we need more people out there using them for the complementary tear-jerk purposes that lend credibility to anonymity and counter government assertions that only criminals have a need to hide their identities. It's important to show them that for every imaginary bomb-toting, money-laundering child pornographer, there are 100 HIV-positive teens, abused women, or political dissidents out there looking for a way to communicate safely. It's time the deck is stacked in our favor. A couple months ago, the President's, key, the President's Working Group on Unlawful Contact on the Inter Conduct on the Internet, chaired by Janet Reno, issued a 200K report which predict predictably expressed the need for government ability to determine, quote, the source of anonymous emails that contain bomb threats, quote. The interagency group was formed in August of 1999 by the President and includes such notaries as FBI Director Louis Free, Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, Commerce Secretary William Dowie, and representatives from the military, DEA, and Secret Service. The group is asked to address the issue of unlawful conduct involving the use of the internet and to prepare a report with recommendations on the extent to which existing federal laws, this is a quote, provide a sufficient basis for effective investigation and prosecution of unlawful conduct that involves the use of the internet, such as the illegal sale of guns, explosive controlled substances, and prescription drugs, as well as fraud and, of course, child pornography. The report stated that anonymous remailers can be used to protect the privacy of dissidents in oppressive countries, but can also frustrate police who can't figure out the message. Duh. <laughs> of course, of course, most abuses of online anonymity of online anonymity can be promulgated through traditional means. Death threats, for instance, can be equally hard to trace when delivered by phone or mail as when delivered through the internet. Additionally, people sometimes fear that liberous material can be distributed anonymously, leaving them no one to sue. This danger is the flip side of anonymous whistleblowing, which most people would agree is a socially valuable use of anonymity. But such misuses are only as effective as the gullibility of the recipient allows. All whistleblowing should be checked by an authoritative expert before the public believes the charges. Freedom of expression must be allowed. With this freedom comes all sorts of problems, but these types of problems are not unique to the internet. Unpopular speech is a necessary consequence of free speech, and it was decided long ago 
During the drafting of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, that the advantages of free speech outweigh the disadvantages. This principle should hold on the internet as well. Anonymous remailers provide a vital service with many benefits to the online community. Bennett's downfall was due less to its imperfect security than to its success. Because of the ubiquitous Because of the ubiquitousness of pennant header on files posted anonymously to mailing lists and news groups, you have got more than his share of unwanted attention. For example, the London Observer, in a rabid scare piece on the imagined scour scourge of kitty porn on the net, accused him by name as being a, quote, key link in the international pedophile chain, quote. Of course, you know, these, the investigation turned out none of this was true, but hey, you know, the media printed it. Other critics have simply cited the ease with which anonymous remailers can be used to harass people, illegally distribute classified information, or spread bootleg graphics or music. True enough, except that these same problems plague the phone system and the U.S. Postal Service, and no one there, I'm sorry, and there haven't been many proposals to shut them down. My final topic of the day is where the remailer network is headed. As I said at the top of the hour, I've heard numerous times that the need for a free, public remailer network is gone. I have strong personal reasons to disagree with that statement, but hey, let's suppose it's true for a second. Diversity is important. Even if hush mail and freedom and whatnot provide everything the public remailer network does, with all sorts of bells and whistles, so what? I keep a flashlight next to my bed in case the power goes out. I back up my files. I'd rather have the remailer network out there and not need it, than need it and not have it. That said, development on the remailer network is hardly dead. Proposals for Mixmaster version 3 have been floating around for a while. You can grab the most recent Mixmaster tarball via anonymous FTP from mixmaster.anonymizer.com. Additionally, many of the remail operators have their own pet side projects aimed at improving services and providing entirely new ones. The looming threat of the RIP bill has spawned a flurry of new interest in modifying remail protocols. The coding product project Angel would make use of session keys that could never be accessible to the remail operator. Volatile memory patches may also achieve the same effect. Brian Fordham's radio clash is in pre-data. It's a distributed communication system aimed at implementing our processes Who's On First protocol. Who's On First works as follows. When one node Alice wishes to send a message to node Bob, Alice connects to Bob and sends him a session key. All further traffic between Alice and Bob is encrypted with the session key, which is used only one time. How do they exchange session keys? Each node has a signing key good for, say, two weeks, and a general encryption key good for a much shorter period, one day, maybe less. When Alice wants to send a message to or through Bob, she gets Bob's current encryption key and verifies the signature against Bob's current signing key. She then creates a session ID and session key, signs it with her own signing key, encrypts it with Bob's public key, and, all is, and sends it to him. Bob decrypts the message, verifies the signature, and if all is well, uses the session key and ID for all further messages in that session. Session keys are discarded after use. So, if the session key is compromised, only that current session is in danger. If the general key is compromised, all traffic for that day or however long the key is good for is in danger. Another thing about who's on first is that all traffic is encrypted end to end, meaning that if a rogue node operator recorded all traffic through his node, he wouldn't know the previous and next hop. He would know the previous and next hop, but nothing more. He wouldn't even know if the previous hop was the first or the next was the final. My favorite pet project, though, is the concept of so-called stealth remailers. I admit the name in and of itself is part of my attraction to the idea, but the concept's pretty cool, too. Stealth remailers I've seen use, make, make use of two scripts which, which wrap Mixmaster. One is for sending, and one is for receiving. Essentially, the remailer looks in a specified Usenet group for messages with subjects like Attention Stealth Remailer Alice. It yanks copies down, processes them in a big batch, and then sends them off via something like send.nim.alias.net. Stealth remailers are great for operators without a 24-7 connection. Message processing can be done whenever the operator feels like connecting to the network. Because the remailer is itself making use of a pseudonym, the operator is effectively sidestepping complaints and many other headaches which can come with running a standard 24-7 remailer. Finally, my little plug on why I run my remailer. I've used remailers for a long time, the general f and the general theory behind remailer security is that as long as at least one of the remailers you use has not been compromised by nefarious types, then you're pretty safe. Trust no one, that's certainly the creator of the remailer network. Anyway, I figured the best way to make sure at least one of the remailers I used wasn't owned by the NSA was to run one myself. Of course, you have no reason to, to suspect I'm not in league with the NSA. If you're concerned about that, it wouldn't hurt you to open up your own public remailer. 
There's a substantial amount of window software out there that makes running and using anonymous remotes painless. I don't know much about it. I don't run it. As I said earlier, you can grab Mixmaster Tarball from mixmaster.anonymizer.com. The rest of the Unix remote tools are pretty old and can use some reworking. There aren't many of us remops, and we could use some help. Remotes are neat. They encourage you to examine source code and write scripts. They thwart Big Brother. They improve your diplomacy skills. I don't know whether or not they get you checks, but hey, run your own and find out. All right, that's all I've got. Questions?